This is Lynn Fraser with the Radical Recovery Summit. I really enjoyed speaking with Dr. Mary Jane McCallum, a citizen of Barren Lands First Nation in Brashat, Manitoba. She attended the Guy Hill Residential School in the Paw for 11 years from the age of six. She is a Canadian senator. She is an advocate for social justice, and she shares her personal experience as a residential school survivor in an effort to raise awareness and understanding. She is also the first Indigenous dentist in Canada. She is the first woman and first Indigenous person to be a chancellor at Brandon University. She is truthful, committed, wise, and an honor to speak with. You're a full-time senator in the Canadian Senate. Uh, So a lot of people who watch this are from the United States, so they wouldn't be that familiar with our system. But do you want to talk a little bit about your work in the Senate? You've been in the Senate for several years now. It'll be my fifth year on December 13th. You know, when I worked out in the field, people plant seeds in your head, right? And I went back home to my reserve and worked there as um, a dentist. And one of the teachers and I, we went to attend a chief and council meeting. And the teacher said, why are you here practicing dentistry on individuals when Indigenous issues are overarching? And I said, I'm happy where I am. But because of that, I started reading and starting to understand the social determinants of health and their impact on health. And then the legislation I always knew was a problem for First Nations, the funding. I just read and read and read. And then an elder at home said, look, come here. I was in the nursing station and I looked up and she said, that's where you'll be one day. And it was the governor general. Uh So when I was ready, I said, Ron, how do I put my name in for governor general? He said, you shouldn't go. He said, that's just figurehead. You should apply to Senate. And I said, okay, because Trudeau had changed it, so I did it. And, you know, when I walked in, I knew that was where I was meant to be. Uh, I just had that intuition. Like when I went into my two homes that I owned uh, in the doorway, I knew those were my homes. mm -hmm. When I was given a tenure track position at the faculty of dentistry, I always thought I wanted to teach. I remember thinking, I have to know this stuff because I have to, to teach you know, later in life, I walked in and I knew that Mm -hmm. was not. And I said to the dean, I'm not going to stay. My spirit will die in here. Mm -hmm. And then when I walked in Senate, I knew, you know, so I was prepared because of all the reading I did on mental health on different areas. It's such a hard place to work when you're Indigenous, when you're First Nation. Bet. You know, yeah. you can see the colonialism that exists and it's exhibited. And you just think, how are we going to move out of this? Because colonialism is in each of us, whether we're the colonizer or the colonized. And we all have that those two in us. It's mm-hmm. finding that balance that I don't want to be a colonizer, but I don't want to be colonized. And it will always remain because Canada is its foundation is colonialism. When I look at a bill, I look at how it's going to further recolonize our people or further heap oppression on them, especially the leadership, so that this legislation piles up and piles up, you know, more work for them to do. And I don't think people see it. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it yesterday. I saw it clearly and I spoke up about the bills I worked with the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the Manitoba Kiwitno Ogimagana MKO, they're called, but they're the Grand Chiefs work for, you know, all of Manitoba for AMC and Mm -hmm. MKO, it's the Northern part. So I have to do the same with the Southern Chiefs and I will do that over Christmas. So the work that I do And the motions I bring to the floor, the order of reference, the speeches are all grassroots or leadership initiated concerns. Mm -hmm. So as an example, I have one motion that is to deal with anti-racism 
as the sixth pillar of the Canada Health Act. Because when you look at the other pillars, there's five. There's comprehensiveness and accessibility. If you have racism, it's going to impact those two immediately. Yes, yes. So why do we pretend it's all accessible or it's all comprehensive? Mm -hmm. And that came from the Brian Sinclair Working Group in Manitoba, and they're in the university. Mm -hmm. So we do that work with them. And the one with the resident apology to residential school, former students and intergenerational, I worked with that with elders across Canada. Mm -hmm. And they did issue an apology from Senate. You know, there is racism, in, there was racism in it, and it's a huge thing. So, you know, the work and Senate, it's our obligation to work with underrepresented groups, with minorities, with the Aboriginal people, with the disability community, because those groups are not represented in the House of Commons because it's by majority and we're su such a small of the population of Canada. So Senate is supposed to counteract that, you know, and bring those to the floor. So that's why I'm bringing the voices to the floor and people listen. And they always understood that they mattered, but Canada didn't. Right. You know, it wasn't, it was as if we didn't matter. And they started it right from the doctrine of discovery when they said, there's no one living here. Right. Then we were invisible immediately and we didn't matter. So right. I deal with that, the invisibility, that we matter and the voice so that we start to regain the power and spirit that that I gave up when I was in residential school or was taken from me. Mm -hmm. And that it's important to every time you speak, every time you give voice, you know, whether it's art or singing you take back a little bit of that spirit and power. And I tell people we work with, don't ever give that away. So when I went to the House of Commons, and it was about the ribbon skirt that I worked on with a little girl who's 10 and the chief, and it passed, it's law now. Mm -hmm. And when they said to me, this is such a good bill that you brought forward. And I said, it's not my bill. It's right. this little girl and it's the chief must not forget that we are speaking on behalf of other people, you know, and people, when they realize that, it builds up their core, you know, and understand that they have that resilience, that power within them to be self-determining. So, um, you know, it's a hard place to be, and it's a beautiful place to be, and I am very honored to be working with the senators that I do. And I know it's a privilege. And I always remember that. But I always remember that it was our ancestors that fought so hard, that were so determined and persistent, that the generations yet to come would not be in the place that they're at. And we aren't. So then my mm -hmm. job now is to do the same work for the generations yet to come. It's legacy yeah. passed on, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's so many directions we could go I, with this yeah. conversation. Yeah. One of them is Indigenous people have an understanding of colonization from the colonized. A lot of white settlers have the perspective of I don't even know what that is. I don't know why you're still bringing that up. What does it have to do with me? And I'm seeing over the last several years, there is a little bit more education, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and how shocked everybody seemed to be when the greys were found in the Kamloops residential school. Some people at least are tuning into learning more about it. What's your sense of where are we at in Canada in terms of understanding colonization and the impact of that? You know, part of the work we do, we do webinars, our Senate offices. So mine is right now is looking at interjurisdictional impacts of legislation and, and the gaps that Indigenous people fall into. And with one of the webinars, I have had the privilege of meeting 
Buffy St. Marie and Elenis Ombasowin. Oh, nice. Bedrin invited me to dinner with them. And in that dinner, they started talking about the change, you know, because they're both in their 80s that mm -hmm. they've seen over the years. Because, you know, with this work we do, sometimes it's you're focused on change, so it's a negative. And they said, you know, there's been positive change. And I said, could you come to Senate or, you know, through virtual present on that? And they agreed. So we did it. Buffy took us through her time in the 60s when she sang and where she went. Amazing, amazing work when you're alone. She knew that was her destiny, her gift. And there has been positive change. So when you look at where are we, to be sitting in Senate and debating on colonialism is something I never, ever thought in, that I would witness in my lifetime. So that's why mm -hmm. I, it's such a privilege to be there. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can make people aware of it is to speak about it and to bring up different mm -hmm. conversations to the Senate floor. You know, and it's happening because when I came there, residential school was nope that was a hundred years ago you know but that is what Canada has taught us and it's nothing to blame other senators or members of parliament this is how Canada was but in that small space of time there's been growth in everyone I think the biggest problem is when we meet someone that's indifferent and they're not going to listen this is how it is Right. Then those ones, you cannot change their way of thinking, nor mm -hmm. can you concentrate on them. So for me to be able to be on the floor and to debate and to work with First Nations, there's tremendous movement, transformative change there. We just have to look at now how our legislation, you know, the inbreeding of systemic racism and it's been absorbed by let's say the civil servants because mm -hmm. that's how they've been taught and right. how do you then connect with other Canadians and I don't know if you know I'm a chancellor at Brandon University so I work with the university and looking at that inbreeding of intolerance of systemic racism within academia and you know they were already had started that work before i joined them i just got off a zoom meeting with them and it's so great to see how the university has stepped up to the plate and inv and tried to involve indigenous people in this strategic plan for the next five years and i say tried because we had requested people to come and we didn't receive a response from some but it's the way I approached it and I have to formally do some stuff to work with certain people so we're going to do that in the new year but that change is happening and they're indigenizing and decolonizing as much as they can and we do yeah. have that conversation right it's okay. seen as important yeah yeah, yeah being seen yeah. and having people give voice to in the university setting, you right. know? And eventually then that will change the whole culture. And, and then in the workplace and yeah. Yeah, and the faculty, you know, the deans, the profs that I've met and worked with, because through as a chancellor, I work, you know, with the deans, I attend meetings with them. There's been such incredible acceptance of me in that role because I'm the first woman to be a chancellor and the first indigenous person mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I work well with them so it says a lot about people that are embracing this change and helping to move it forward so I really am very encouraged you know no that's that's wonderful as I was reading a little bit about your experience in residential school and it's so important that people can be open about the trauma that they've experienced and what actually happened and the impact of that. And I was at a speaking thing with 
Wab Canoe one time. And he said, you know, I bring my, I think his son was six years old at the time. I bring my son to some of these events because then people can look and see this is a human being. This is a child just like any other child. And can we just even for a moment imagine what it must have been like for someone to be put into residential school at that age? So could you want to talk a little bit about that? You, you talk so so moving about what it was like for you and the shame and the destruction or the at least the attempted destruction of your identity as an Indigenous person in residential school. It was really devastating. You know, and as a child, you don't know the word devastation. So you don't know what you're going through. And literally, you shut down because if you don't, you're going to be punished in some way. So, and it allowed, you know, and when I talk about to universities, I talked about if you're going to say, think outside the box, you need to know what's inside that box. I said to them, you know, okay, let me take you in the box with me. So this little girl comes in full of creativity, curiosity, laughter, nurturing, speaking our language, knowing land as teacher. And it's a gentle teacher, right? And you come in like that. And uh, my mom had passed on in December. And I was there three weeks later, Mm. you know, not knowing English. Anyway. So it was very traumatic because I lost my mom, displaced, and then in this cold building. And without any of your family support, aunties, uncles, no. nobody. Yeah. Nobody. And you go in there. So you're in the box as this little girl. And to temper your spirit and to temper your identity, because they need to make you malleable, right? Be able to give you the identity through assimilation of a little white girl. So I said to the audience, you bring in blind obedience as -hmm. an expectation. I said, out goes creativity, out goes curiosity, out goes laughter. All Mm -hmm. those things we have that have been given to us as gifts from the creator and Those are teaching tools. That's the way you learn critical thinking skills. Because now we learn by rote. It's all memory work of Europe, of Greek civilization. And then the notion of sin. Because Mm -hmm. sin is a foundational core of assimilation. I remember seeing girls going into this confessional and I thought, what do they do in there? And then Mm -hmm. they'd come out and they'd kneel and then off they'd go. And then when it was my turn, I was like, I was so excited. So then I learned about sin. And honestly, I said, I am going to be the best sinner because then father will be proud of me. Such convoluted thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I wrote wrote a chapter in the book and it's called Bless Me, Father, for I Have Sinned. And it goes, I remember all my confessions because I thought, okay, what am I going to confess? I wanted to make it as long as possible, which then targets you as this bad little girl. Yeah, yeah. So that notion of sin has stayed with me forever. And I start my chapter with the book on what hell was. And I won first prize because, you know, when you're in trauma, you can think of really bad things. Yes, yes. So I won first prize and I said, and from then to even today, I believe I will go to hell. For one moment in my life, I thought, what have I done to deserve to go to hell? And I could feel that freedom Mm. was gone and I haven't been able to retrieve it. Mm. That early life conditioning is very powerful. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. when you have, you are that conditioned then you have to, they start to mold your character Mm -hmm. as a sinner, as a woman. And then that's where the sexual grooming comes in. Negative sexual grooming of to look at yourself as this deviant squaw, deviant savage. And then they let us out at 16. It's like, okay, that's it. Go. So you're very 
vulnerable because mm-hmm. you you don't have your old ways and you don't have your new ways because you'll never get that new identity because no one is going to allow you. And then go through life. And at some point I thought, I have to go back to that little girl of five and start regaining my original identity, which is what I'm doing now. And what was it the elders taught me? Because that is actually what saved me in residential school and prepared me to be where I am today. And that's the other thing in Indigenous knowledge. You are not an individual. You are a collection of spirit, of teachings from all those that raised you, all Mm. those I met in my life. So when I went for my Senate to be sworn into swearing in, I said that it is not the individual. This is the collective Mary Jane of people preparing me to do the work I need to do. So I got that. I reclaimed that at a certain point where I knew this is where. And when I got in five years ago, I spoke to people and said, it's the collective. And I want to thank you for contributing to my growth in a positive way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what the irony is about all this identity? Because it's the identity they focused on. I went to the Stony Mountain Penitentiary at the request of employees. And you know that that system doesn't work. And it's a new form of residential school. And I said to the warden, I said, you mean that Canada has taken a group of people, attempted to reform their identity? That identity and the abuse, the trauma we went through produced angry people. They're now in prison. And you're now modifying their identity again? I said, isn't Mm -hmm. that ludicrous? It Mm -hmm. is crazy thinking. And oh, I was so angry. So then I thought, we're never going to beat this correction system. So you need to look at where the people are coming from. And 80% of the inmates are from children in care because they're taking away our children. 80%. So we need to work with the children in care and say, we're going to cut that pipeline. So actually, we have a committee that is looking into that and helping people working with children in care, Mm -hmm. you know, and how do we get to them before they go in the pen? Right, right. So when you look at all this trauma that we're working with, and many times it's overwhelming because, you know, when you talked about intersectionality, the social determinants of health, which contribute and maintain illness. And then you have the correction system, you have the resource extraction and all the trauma to communities, trauma to the land, trauma to our environment. And then you have agriculture, and how that contributes to pesticide and herbicides to green algae, which is destroying our water. The water issues, the land issues, you know, that you have research that it's extractive as well, that they go in, they extract indigenous knowledge and never contribute. So right. it's such a stealing of continuously dispossessing land, now bodies, you know, our intelligence and our natural resources. And it's incredibly overwhelming, Mm -hmm. you know, to try and how do you navigate this? And on top of that is that Senate, the oppression there. How do you keep peace within yourself? So it doesn't remain overwhelming so that you know that you are human and there is only so much you can do. You go to those limits and then you give it to the creator to do with what needs to be done. And and then you truly let go. You know, this is beyond the individual. It is. yeah. So it's that teachings of the elders in the past and today that allow me to keep that peace and to understand when I need to seek that peace 
And I had to do that this week. There was quite a few contentious bills that came to the floor. And it, children too, they teach us. You know, when I went, before I became a senator, I was going to schools, talking to students. So they invited me to talk to grade six students. And in once, there was three classrooms. And in one of the groups, they had decided to put their tiles together. It's called Project of the Heart. They had done little tiles with little messages. One group decided to build an Inukshuk. And they said, it shows the way. That's its function. And leadership shows the way. And they said the arms are red because you need courage and you need insight when you're a leader. And the legs are blue because blue signifies peace. And that little boy looked me in the eye and said, you need to know peace as a leader. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. And that's time. when I knew yeah. what we are seeking is peace. Peace mm-hmm. because of the trauma that we've had. Peace because of the ongoing colonization. Peace because we're dispossessed of land and we're limited to little oppressive, segregative tracts of land. Even if you're in the city, it's still segregation because of mm-hmm. poverty, right? Yeah. yeah. So then I've gone to see the homeless, which is another huge topic, that way of life to completely remove themselves from society and be homeless. How do we work with them to find the peace that they need? You know, and people say it's housing or it's this, and it is different for different groups and different strategies work. But when you look, I said to a couple of men, one of them was my patient, I said, why have you done this? And they said, when I'm in a room, the room starts to close in. Because when Um, you've been sexually abused, you're uncomfortable in certain settings, of course. So one of them couldn't go to school. He could not further his education. The other one neglected his health. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. you don't know what patients bring to you, you know, as a dentist, what they brought to my chair. And especially being a dentist, they say, oh, you're just looking after the the mouth, that's it. But really, you need to work with the mental health because Mm -hmm. that is what's driving illness. That's what's driving the inability of people to move ahead so that they can dig their heels in and get a job. Or, And if they can't, then we really need to say we need to support them in this way. I'm looking now at harm reduction. I just got involved in that formally. Of course, I've dealt with it from residential school, but I didn't call it harm reduction. And when you have a certain population that is not going to move out of that setting, how is it best we support them? Mm -hmm. But then we need to start to look at the varying groups and one, you know, the intermediate groups and finally the preventive with the children. And where do we say we can't do, we're just going to support you now. And then how do we help the ones that want to go back to being productive citizens in how they define productive lives? So it's been honestly such an educational experience for me to, to look at how I'm healing in the midst of heaped different prongs of trauma. And to be able to navigate in there and understand and be willing to say, I have done all I can and I can sleep. You know, of course, there's that sadness, but literally that is what you do for the people you represent, you know. So then I look at this experience that I'm having in Senate and the personal growth that I'm also doing as I'm navigating this, you know. So it's been challenging and frightening, of course. And, you know, and it would be even more so for people that don't know where to get the resources. 
you know, like I have yeah. the elders I can call. Mm -hmm. I have so much privilege and, you know, and we're passing laws and people to access the benefits need a computer. They need to be literate in computer. They need the internet and people don't have it. And it's like, why aren't we putting in the resources so people can really use this legislation? You know, and yeah, but you, it's very complex. It's so complex. I don't know if that answered your question, but when I was in residential school, I had played piano for seven years and with incredible violence by the nun. And only five months ago, I had gone to a medicine woman who I went to residential school with, and she's told me, take cedar baths. Mm -hmm. No, this was, and before that, I, had gotten a piano because I didn't, when that nun left, I did not play piano until two years ago. I was gifted. I thought maybe if I do this, I'll, it'll help me to, to heal. And I tried, but I couldn't. So I had this Métis man come and he's a piano tuner. And he said, let me look at your hands. It was the first time I ever thought of my hands as sites of violence. Um, you know, when you're hit in the head or if you're sexually abused or you see them as sites of violence, but with right. my hands part. Right. I, and mm -hmm. he said, let me look at your hands. He said, I am so sorry. And then he said, come here. And he took the piano apart and he, and he played. And I said, what a happy instrument. But of course, I didn't see that. It was an instrument of violence. It was connected to violence. So right. this association. I went, yes, I went to bed. I woke up perfectly fine. He left at midnight and I went to bed. Not happy, but just when I realize certain aspects of myself that have been hidden, I get very excited about it. And I went to bed. In the morning, I could barely walk. I could not move my head around. So I called the medicine woman, and she said, take cedar baths. And I have wild cedar trees growing in the back. So, And even to go out and clip them, I was so stiff. And I brought them in, boiled the cedar. My husband had to take it up because I couldn't even carry a, a dipper. And then I took my baths. just thought about this piano. The second night, I thought, I have never, ever thought of forgiving Sister St. Arma. And then the third night I had my cedar bath, I woke up at 1.30 and I understood the importance of forgiving her and letting go of that violence that I carried right. within me all those years. Mm -hmm. And then I took my fourth cedar bath and then I had to redo them again, maybe three weeks ago. When I realized that I knew I had to take more because of just the ongoing from there, you know, the impact of lateral violence and I hadn't seen it as violence. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to the Pope's apology, I just saw the colonialism, people dropping back into being the colonized. And right. it shocked me, and I was so angry about it, mm -hmm. you know. And I listened to the speeches and came home. And then I got sick for, not COVID, but literally I was down for four weeks. Right. I think it was all that all stuff that coming up, the sin, right? Remember the sin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go to the popes, but I took people there that I knew wanted to go and had been in residential school with me. Mm -hmm. And I took them. Right. And then really listened to, you know, just that colonial act of attending mass and listening to the sermon again about the Roman Catholic church being the dominant right figure of God. I thought, you just did away with all your speech yesterday where you supported spirituality and people didn't pick that up because they, I think people want to be so forgiven because they're indigenous in brown bodies and they don't realize it. Mm -hmm. 
when we get back to that, the doctrine of discovery that says you don't exist. And even now the, you know, people that are saying you need to repeal the doctrine of discovery, and that's not even on the table. Oh, I'm bringing it to Senate. And I just look to see who's at the, who's going to take it. And then I usually go to them and say, do you want me to work with this on you? And I raised it this week with one of the bills. And I said, I asked the sponsor, how will you deal with the doctrine of discovery? Because you're dealing with the Natural Resource Act, which was unilaterally given to the provinces and once again made First Nations invisible about their treaty rights. Mm -hmm. But of course, people can't respond to it or they don't want to. But it will come to the table because we're ready to go there. And it's the foundation of Canada. It is. And people say, what is it with this doctrine of discovery? Like, why do they keep bringing it up? So the good thing is that they are curious. So when people are curious, they're going to, you know, take one stance. And if they take a different stance from me, that's okay. They're growing, you know. They're engaged. They're they're Mm -hmm. engaged. That's the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is movement. Remember when you said, where are we? Like to have the doctrine of discovery said on the Senate floor, Mm -hmm. it's movement forward. It is. Well, one thing you said a little bit earlier on is we can only work with the people who are willing to look at these things. And we can't really do anything about the people who are just obstructive and and who who are objectifying and dehumanizing us. We can't really work with that. But there are a lot of really big possibilities of working with people who aren't like that. And when we look at some of the problems that are happening in the world right now, it's just so clear that this, you know, the fight, flight and freeze, the effect of trauma, and then people push other people away. And they're like, you're not even human to me. And that's a big obstacle to overcome the objectification and dehumanization that happens externally, but also the way we, we kind of, we have those core deficiency beliefs of I'm not a good person, I'm a bad person. And the effect of trauma rolls through our communities a little bit differently, but there's a lot of commonality there. Yeah, there is. And, you know, when you look at the word harm reduction, because I was asked to be a keynote speaker. And I will start to get engaged in conversations where I'm not. And harm reduction was one of those. And so I thought, okay, what does harm reduction mean to me? And to me, I separated it into the personal and then into the work that I do. And there's stuff in between. I haven't figured it out because this is... So I said to the group, you know, when I look at harm reduction, I had to start with myself. And how do I reduce the harms within myself to be able to do the work I do so I'm not causing more harms? Mm -hmm. And I said, so I had to look at this one with the piano and the sexual grooming. And it wasn't only sexual grooming by nuns. It was with girls, too, because Mm -hmm. people, the lateral violence starts. And people don't know why they act the way they do, Mm -hmm. you know, and comes from it. And the bad medicine we learn, like rumor, and people will say to me, you used to be so wild when you were young. And I said, you know, or you used to be such a drunk. And I said, you know, that was 30 years ago. I have moved on. Why haven't you moved on? I said, do you want people to stay the way they were? Mm -hmm. That's not our role. Our role is to engage people and create safe, sacred spaces for them to be able to become vulnerable so they can move on. Because if you don't make yourself vulnerable to me, that's when I grow the most. But it's a scary place to be because then people can use that and attack you in your most vulnerable, right? Yeah. And I said, so to me, harm reduction was working on myself. The issues that I can see, of course, they'll be hidden ones that I don't see yet. I said, and 
correct, you know, trying to deal with those so that when I do harm reduction in, like, let's say the health field, you know, because the health field, the harm reduction there will be different from the harm reduction when we look at legislation, you're looking at different tools that you're going to use. I said, so we look at the health field and we look at addiction. I said, now let's look at addiction. What is the cause of the addiction? Because if we don't know it, we're not going to be able to do harm reduction, yeah. right? And right now, the one thing that people don't talk about is sexual abuse. If you don't deal with, if we don't deal with that, with our children, because it's still rampant with non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people. It's it all segments. It's not only First Nations. I said, nothing we do is going to work. And then I talked from there. And I said, and when you take over harm reduction, you have to see if you're colonized, a colonizer, because if you are, you're going to carry on the same policies that the government has. And being a brown body delivering these colonized policies is not going to, it's not going to work just because we're brown bodies. But if we look at this as a colonized person, then we're going to judge ourselves and say, well, who am I to bring change? I said, so you really have to look at mental health to assess where we are in all the work that we do. I said, I didn't even write a conclusion to my speech because I'm just starting this conversation within, you know, I mean, the word harm reduction is newer, but it was always present in our lives. We didn't just call it harm reduction, you know, and some of the people came to me after and said, for the first time, I'm starting to learn what harm reduction is, you know, and then the next keynote, the next day came, oh my God, she did a fabulous job. Fabulous. And you should interview her. It's Susan Aglu-Clark. She did this awesome job of dealing with a segment of her life and the song she produced to bring this out. Sang mm-hmm. us, I think, seven songs in person. Wow. Oh, my God. She was, she's fabulous. Anyway, that's amazing. Somebody, yeah. Amazing woman. Mm-hmm. So then that harm reduction is, and I'm just starting to look at it because I was been in the health field. It was easier for me to start looking at that. But where does harm reduction to me seem to be too much? And my niece had talked to me and, you know, she said, I went to BC and she knew people on the street from home. And she said, you know, they can just go to this building and get all this food free. And I thought, it's like welfare. How do you entrench this way of life so that they're able to move out of it? So I disagreed with that part. And I have spoken to people and said, I don't know how. I haven't had an experience walking and going to work with people on the streets and how this is you know, and maybe that's something I should do, you know, so I've just started looking at that, but harm reduction in legislation and the laws we pass, you know, I think I'm going to start framing my speeches around that, bringing the word harm reduction in as to be a word that's looked at and used in different contexts, whether you're in the prison, whether you're in human rights, because there's human rights there, whether you're in agriculture, because it's not only harm reduction to us as people, it's harm reduction to our environment, and that's land and air and water. Mm -hmm. And how do we work all this? So when you talked about intersectionality, then you look at harm reduction and say, what's involved here? You know, where do we need to reduce the harms? And just to start with a basic recognition of humanity. Yes, the people are worth saving until they can kind of climb out of whatever it is that's going on. We need a lot more support for trauma healing. Yeah. And we need these short term programs and we need a longer term, like a bigger perspective, like you're talking about. Yeah. What is actually going to help? Yeah. What is going to help? And where do we get that? 
knowledge because, uh, you know, I was talking to one woman, she's applying for a job in harm reduction. I said, the danger is that we think I have this condo and that is the solution. And it mm-hmm. isn't. Right, it's not. Space in a building, in a structure. You know, what I was getting to was that our interpretation of what they need will not work. And it's like, how do we get them to speak to us, you know, get the people to speak to us, to teach us, to make us aware, to educate? Well, for me, because I'm just starting this Mm -hmm. so that I know where I could support them. I may be able to support them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, why I have a hard time with it is because when you're traumatized, it's very easy for people to keep moving. So they'll get a Mm -hmm. stable apartment. Mm -hmm. And I say stable because they have a stable job. They're able to pay. They have the furniture. And they'll get up and move to another province, leaving everything. They'll start again. And, you know, it's the mobility of the people that they're walking, walking. And I know, I understand for me, when I would walk like that is to keep thoughts out of my head. Put myself in such a position that I don't have to think. Just think how bad I am that I'm drinking and on doing what I'm doing. So, you know, like, and I think, okay, why are they moving? And when I started in Senate, I met one of the special, there's a special police force that goes between Senate House of Commons and, you know, the government buildings on Parliament Hill in in Ottawa, where I am today. And he said, when you're settling, make sure you build space where you can declutter your mind and bring yourself back. So what I've put there is my sage, my tobacco, my mm-hmm. medicines, right? And mm-hmm. pictures of children and elders. And he said, you know, sometimes in life, we move so much that our spirit yeah. doesn't have time to latch. Right. There's I a thought, lot of ways to escape. I thought that is what I've been doing. And then uh-huh. I said, you know what? That makes so much sense when you look at people that are in the penitentiaries. They're now forced to stop. And a lot yeah. of them start the healing. They start, you right. know, because their spirit has caught up with them. Anyway, that was a big part, a big teaching for me to start in Senate. But at the same time, you can work so much that your spirit doesn't have time. You know, you're busy doing this. If you don't acknowledge a smudge to inform the work and the intent of the work that you do, you know, and I I will smudge my papers. Mm -hmm. And before I go and deliver my speech, it's sacred work. Eh? Sacred work. Yeah. It's sacred work. And, yeah. you know, and when you look at, let's say I was a dentist and I came out and it's the Western teaching that the mouth is separate from the body. And when the patient comes, you do quad one, two, three, four, clean. The patient is done. Your work is done. And at some point in my life, through listening to people, I realized that it's such a colonial way to work. And it was a little girl because I know I thought I have to do all this. And a little girl, I was trying to take a radiograph, an x-ray, and it was hurting her mouth. And I actually got angry and it was in my face because I couldn't do it. And she just looked at me in fear. Right, right. No. I thought, what am I doing? It was one of those moments of clarity of this is wrong and it is violent and I started to change the way I did work I no longer gave the government huge a huge number of patients because now I started talking to my patients and what I said to Senate was because I compared Senate to Senate is sacred space and I said you know I thought this is a sacred space that I'm working on on a sacred spirit and this is ceremony I'm doing. So I better be understand it to be respectful. So it's the sacred space 
the sacredness of the spirit and the ceremony. And when you enter that, you can't enter with negative energy because if you're angry or anything, that energy goes into your patient. And it took me a while. And you know, when I realized this is inappropriate, I didn't say, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done all these years? I just moved into uh, into that. So I did a speech in Senate saying, this is sacred space. We start off with prayer. We do scroll, which is the intent. We debate, and then we close off in prayer again. You know, just so they could start thinking differently about the work they do. When I talk to teachers, I talk to criminal law students, I'll say that to them. This is sacred space. So that people start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. I said, because Western education doesn't teach us that part. We have to find that for ourselves somehow. I know the work I do, I consider it to be sacred work. Yeah. And it's very satisfying to do sacred work. It is. And we also need to do it in a way that's sustainable for ourselves. Like you said, we can get too involved in the work. I know I've been trying to find more of a balance for myself the last few years. I love the work I do. It's really helpful. It's meaningful. And it needs to be sustainable for me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, working through all this and looking at everything we've talked about so that we remain healthy and we remain at peace within ourselves and, you know, to make it so we can continue to do the work we do. Yes. And at the same time, spending time with your family, you know, Mm -hmm. and I have uh, two grandchildren and realized I had never, I'm going to cry, that, you know, you could take not mattering to such an extent that you think God would never give you grandchildren, but I didn't deserve them. And I realized that, and, you know, and that was a hidden part for me, that I didn't realize that that part of that trauma I hadn't seen. And then being careful not to shut down, because I can do that just like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, and I have to be careful, because when uh, I had given up my son for adoption when I was 23, and just reconnected back with him in 2016. So I didn't know my grandson until he was nine. Oh. mm -hmm. And I went to visit them. I've spent time with them. And thank God I did, because he's now 14. It would be hard to start a new relationship at that age. But this second grandchild, so Chase is 14, and Nor, which is in Danish, it means North. Nor is eight months, nine months. Oh, it's a baby. The baby. So it was with this baby that I made that realization that God would never give me a grandchild, because I didn't deserve one. And then not to shut down. To let yourself really feel that. To let myself feel that and feel him. Because when I shut down in residential school, and it was the lonesomeness I had to shut down first, that I could move anywhere and not feel lonely ever. So when I was a dentist in the PAW, my daughter was articling. She took law school in Dalhousie. She articled. And she applied to come to the pot and got it. So we lived together while she articled. And it was so good to understand how oppressive and violent articling is for students. I bet. Mm -hmm. And that they actually don't have some rights, you know, and law society did that, which is crazy. And when she left, she was done. That lonesomeness hit me. For the first time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm leaving the paw. I cannot stay here. It's as if she had passed on and I thought, we'll never walk. You know, she has a dog. We'll never walk these streets. We'll not go to. And it was near. The paw is half an hour from the residential school site when I went. I worked there as a dentist. Every day I would go to the residential school and just... It's not there. I would sit on the ground and think about my history. So we would go there together. You and your daughter. 
me and my daughter, and I, I, we have reunions, and I, I speak at many of them. So I brought my kids so they can hear. It was so difficult for me to do the dentistry. I knew I couldn't leave Pasqua Cree Nation because I knew geography wasn't going to correct the problem, right? And I just stayed there. And then one, with one of the patients, the other assistant came in and said, your daughter is outside. And I thought, what is she doing here? She doesn't belong here. But it was for my other, for the other assistant. Was at that moment, I let my daughter go because I was hoping she'd move to the paw and live with me there. Mm. You know, unrealistic thinking, right? And I was able to let her go and really start to heal. So when you are rediscovering the depth and power and frightening emotions as an adult, I could see it would be easy for me to shut down with my grandchild and do things with him, but not have my, you know, not be fully engaged, right? Right, yeah. And now I, you know, like this week, I've been three weeks in Ottawa because we have work to do, and I normally stay here. I worry about the carbon footprint of flying back and forth, and I do concentrate my work here. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm disciplined, I do my work, I have, anyway, and I really, really miss my family of that reconnection that that mm-hmm. reconnection to to emotions right yeah some of those emotions are really sad they are and you know like being lonely is something i didn't experience in ottawa before and i am now as i'm reconnecting with loneliness it takes anyway, a lot of courage and you know one of the elders said to me We were looking at the residential school and I had to do my speech. So I talked to him and he said, well, now you're going to have to dig deep and get that courage from inside. You know, so I understand that courage. And people say the day you're going to practice courage is one of the most difficult days you'll have. Doing a lot of transformative changes within and without. And in all different fields, you know. But, I mean, the Creator gave us our gifts to be able to do the work we need to do. Well, I really appreciate our conversation and really admire what you do and the presence you bring to that. And uh, thank you so much for your work and and for, for talking with me. Thank you for watching the Radical Recovery Summit 2023. To watch more of the interviews and the clips, and to share with your friends, please go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com.